I will only mention a few of the most powerful and shocking miracles, miracles that may sound unbelievable to some people. However, these are all realities and historical events known by everyone in the area. I will continue with one great miracle that took place in the years of the German occupation when the cross was in the hands of my mother. In those days, the Germans apprehended about 500 men and they had kept them locked up in the public high school. They left them without food and water for about three days, and a large committee approached the bishop to intervene with the commanding German officers to allow the committee to take food and water to the captives. The bishop, for reasons that he would only know, did not intervene, and no one else in the entire area was found to take up such a daring and courageous feat. They were all afraid of the consequences. My mother heard this, and without wasting a moment, she collected food and other pertinent supplies from the three nearby villages by the grace of the Holy Cross. She also boiled as many eggs as she could, and she took everything to, to Rathimno for the captives. While approaching the school, the German soldiers pointed their guns at her. She was not phased, and she took all the food and the other supplies, and she gave them to the guards. Naturally, they could not communicate, but by the help of an interpreter, they asked her what was the reason of her visit. She told the interpreter, please tell the officer that I do not have a single relative in here, and if they doubt me, they can ask all the captives, and if they find one related to me, they can punish me as they wish. But as a woman of God and as a mother, I feel for all of their mothers who are anxiously waiting for them and I thought to make the effort to bring them some food. If it is not too much trouble, they can go ahead and give it to those people inside. Otherwise, they can use their food any way they want. It seems that the commanding officer was a good man, and he granted her request, not excluding the possible influence of the grace of the Holy Cross. They opened the door, and my mother walked in. You can imagine the excitement and cries of joy of the, these poor people who fell on her, and they said, no, we don't care much about food, but we need a little water because we are dying of thirst. Outside of the school, there were two buckets of water. She kept refilling them from the spigot of the schoolyard from morning until noon, going back and forth until all the 500 detainees had satisfied their thirst. When she finished being at the state of exhaustion, she thought to pass from the bishop's quarters. He saw her full of joy, and he asked her what was happening with her. She said, Your Grace, I'm sorry that I didn't pass to see you earlier, but I was busy all morning, and she explained everything she had done for the prisoners. He was dumbfounded. He got up and hugged her. He called her, Dear Mother, you are worthy of honor. Congratulations. The witnesses at the court were right. From this point on, you are free to do whatever you want. And from 1944 up until the time of her death in 1975, she was free to go anywhere she wanted without any kind of hindrance. In 1945, I left for the junior high school of Hanya. My mother was coming to visit me often and uh, to check up on my progress. And in the process, hundreds of people found out about the grace of the Holy Cross, and they were flocking to her, especially drawn to the Holy Cross, where many couples with problems of infertility. Many of them became parents after being blessed by the precious cross. And let's listen to a great miracle in this area involving the general governor of Crete, Emmanuel Bakladzis, who went to become a member of the parliament and later on the president of the Greek parliament. He was married for about 12 years, but the inability to have a child was hanging like a dark cloud over their otherwise happy marriage. God did not give them a child, and they were greatly saddened. He did, however, learn about the grace of the Holy Cross, and he brought his wife to my mother, requesting her prayers so God would give them a child. After the blessing with the cross, the couple brought to life a, a healthy little boy, and the governor was elated, and wanting to express his gratitude, requested to have the child baptized in my mother's village, Rustica, and in a church that she rebuilt herself. So one afternoon, they left from Hanya, and they were heading towards Rustica to complete the sacrament. However, he removed from the car the official insignia of the governor, and this seemed rather suspicious for the guards of the army base in Suda, who suspected that the governor's car may have been stolen, 
So he ordered a roadblock. The police signaled the governor to stop and explain their action. The governor, in turn, explained to the officers that he's on his way to baptize his child in Rustica, and he was trying to escape unnecessary publicity. So he removed the insignia from the car. So my mother baptized this child, and she became a godmother again for the 680th time. She had solved infertility problems for about 480 couples, all by the grace of the most precious cross. About 200 of them were born with some health problems, or their parents may have been facing a health issue, so they promised the child to be baptized on the day of the Holy Cross, or they vowed to call the child Stavros or Stavrula, and after their baptism, they regained their health. Can you imagine having close to 700 godchildren? This is enough to show the magnitude and the amazing grace of the most precious cross of Christ. It was finally of significance with my mother. She was granted the gift of foreseeing the outcome of the workings of the Holy Cross. In other words, she would be able to tell the visiting people if they would become well, or if they would need an operation, or if they needed to take some prescribed medicine, or sometimes they would tell them that, no, it's God's will for you not to become well. Interestingly enough, she had an excellent relationship with the medical profession and the doctors. In Hanya, the pathologist and the radiologist, when they would hear from the patients that Mrs. Hadzina sent me here, they would ask, uh, what was her diagnosis? And they would say exactly what my mother had prognosed. To their amazement, time after time again, their professional diagnosis totally agreed with my mother's prognosis. Based on this, I will tell you an amazing diagnosis that was initially rejected by the doctors, but it was finally accepted. This event happened to my mother herself. During the German occupation, she went to a village called Saitures to cross some of the sick. On a way, however, she was thrown off her horse, possibly by demonic energy, because during those days she had healed some demon-possessed lady, but this only God would know for sure. While falling off the animal, she landed on a stone and she raptured her gallbladder. This took place in 1946, and she finally had an operation in 1952, and for all these six years, her body functioned without a sound gallbladder and without any harm from the loose bile flowing into the body. She decided to proceed with an operation, and she made arrangements with the Blue Cross Hospital in Athens. Mr. Bakladzis, who happened to be the president of the parliament, we spoke about him earlier, uh, at that time took her to the best specialist, one of the professors of the medical school of Athens, and he introduced her to him, and he requested to give her the best possible care. He specifically said, please watch over her better than you would watch over me. And whatever needs to be done, do it at any cost. The only thing is, I would like you to do the operation yourself, Mr. Bakladzis added. And how do you know that an operation is even necessary without an examination, the doctor asked. You will understand more when you have a chance to speak with this woman. The professor was a good and faithful man, on the one hand. But on the other hand, Mr. Bakladzis was a respected high official. But he could not accept all this information prior to a medical examination, so he proceeded with the examination. What problems are you having? He asked my mother. Six years ago, I fell off my horse and raptured my gallbladder. How do you know this? Did you have an x-ray? No, but I know. This is what happened. But this is a physical impossibility. You cannot be alive. You cannot live long with a broken gallbladder. You would have died long ago. This would create major complications with your liver. Your liver would be gone. My dear doctor, I'm telling you that this is my problem. And when you proceed to open me up, please do so, but do it in the exact opposite way. Start from the opposite side that your profession tells you. Well, this is absurd. And the doctor calls Mr. Bacaltis uh, to cross-examine this strange patient. Uh, look, Mr. Bakalziz, she's telling me some strange things, not to mention absurd things, totally unorthodox to our profession. What are we to do? Well, I tried to warn you, Mr. Professor, that this woman 
uh, is not your average woman. You'll find some strange but yet very miraculous things, and you will do very well only if you listen to her. So after extended and multi-sided examinations, they decided to proceed with the operation. The surgeon gives instructions to anesthetize her, and she tells them, Doctor, don't bother. Anesthetics don't work on me. What do you mean? How are we going to operate on you? Well, very well. Whatever your profession teaches you, and you will see. They administer the unnecessary anesthesia. She seemed to have fallen asleep, and the professor said, she's anesthetized, so let's proceed. My mother was not speaking. He took the scalpel, and he attempted to make the incision from the position taught by the medical profession. Before he touched her, she tells him, Doctor, did I not tell you to start the incision from the opposite side? Panayemu, help me. The doctor shouted, she's awake. Do precisely what I'm telling you, and you will see. After all this, the surgeon was convinced, and he followed her directions. And lo and behold, they could not believe their eyes. They saw a thin insulating membrane covering the liver, protecting it from the caustic effects of the bile. In other words, this membrane was keeping the secretions of the bile ducts outside of the liver, keeping it unharmed. In the event that the bowel would flow towards the liver with its known emulsifying properties, the liver would have been dissolved and death would have prevailed long ago. The obvious question is here, how did she manage to stay awake during this operation? How did she bear the pain with the grace of the Holy and Venerable Cross and the ascetical life that she lived? Her entire body was basically senseless was already permanently anesthetized. The operation was completed and she became well. Through this process, she got to know the doctor very well. They became close and she went to bid him farewell before she left for Crete. The medical professor who acknowledged on her person all these special gifts and the miraculous powers, he tells her, since the precious cross works so many miracles, this hospital will now be renamed the precious cross of Christ instead of blue cross. So this hospital was renamed and it's called Timio Stavros to this day. From this great miracle, one cannot help but marvel the diagnostic grace that she was given by God. After this operation, she lived another 23 years. She became ill very many times and many times her heartbeat became very weak from the exhaustion and the long hours of standing on her feet the caretaking of the church. She was single-handedly rebuilding her village church, the cells, and all the other structures of the property. But what was especially taxing physically was the blessings and the crossings, the stavromata, as we say in Greek, that she did to thousands of sick people who flowed towards her on a daily basis. One of the doctors of Heraklion pulled me aside and assured me, Patramu, my father, you're her son, and I must tell you the truth. Her heart pulse is dangerously low. Be careful because she can die any day while standing. Try to convince her that she must avoid standing and must avoid getting tired excessively. She must stop uh, all that for a while if you want her to live much longer. So I went to her with this information of the medical doctors, and I added, Mother, I understand the great grace of the precious cross, and I also understand that people are in great need of your services but they can simply come to venerate it on a table stand. They can receive its power and grace that way, and then they can leave. You can no longer stand up all day to cross them. You've done enough. You must rest now. She turns and looks at me with a smile, and she says, You're a priest. Now, assuming that you're very sick in bed, and they come and tell you that an infant is dying, come and baptize it. Would you get out of bed to go? Yes or no? Or would you let the baby die unbaptized? Well, I would have no choice but to go. Then why are you expecting me to sit on my bed to abandon my line of duty? I want to die standing in my line of duty, and God can give me as many days as he wants. I will not abandon my line of duty, and God can do as he pleases. And from now on, I don't want anyone to get involved with my work and my mission. After this, she lived another six years, being always tired, always ill, to the point of exhaustion due to the excessive work necessitated by the many spiritual and physical ills of the Christians whom she served wholeheartedly. 
And we now come to the summer of 1974, a couple of days before the feast day of her church, Holy Transfiguration. The church on its feast day always had great attendance, but this year the crowds were especially greater. About 5,000 people came from all corners of Greece, and my mother blessed people at three different occasions during the day, Vespers, Midnight, and during Matins. And assuming that she only blessed 2,000 out of the 5,000 people, that still brings the number to about 6,000 crossings. She was standing for hours while streams of perspiration were running down her face. The people used to dry her face with their handkerchiefs. I tell her again, Mother, let the cross in the middle of the church so the faithful can venerate it by themselves. Don't overdo it. Go lay down a bit. You will die. My child, I told you before, and I'm telling you again, I want death to find me in the line of duty. That year of August 1974, she blessed with the cross thousands of people while refusing even water during these hours. And by the grace of God, she did not suffer anything at all. All of us who knew her state of health and the warnings of the doctors were crossing ourselves in amazement. This alone shows the great and miraculous power of the life-giving cross. The following year, during the feast day of August 6, 1975, she was in bed sick. Disregarding her illness, she got up. She prepared all the necessary requirements for the feast. She gave the necessary directions. And she laid down on this bed that you see right here. The people began to gather from everywhere. Vesper started, and the people were passing through here to greet her. The next day, she was listening to Divine Liturgy lying down on her bed. After the Divine Liturgy, a meal was always served to all the pilgrims, and after the liturgy, everyone was passing to greet her while taking the bread of our Toklasia from her hand. After everyone served and ate, she asked, were the people served well? Did they have enough to eat? Yes, Mother, they were all very satisfied, and they are finished. Very well. And now my time has come. And instantly her mouth filled with blood. When people saw the blood, havoc was created. Three, four doctors ran to her aid, but there was not much hope. She was pretty much spent. At that moment, a pilgrim was approaching who resided permanently in the United States. He had heard and he wanted to be blessed with a cross. And while coming into the church grounds, he asked, Where's the Yerondesa? They told him, unfortunately, she's very ill and she cannot see you. She's being checked by a number of doctors. He said, I came all the way from America for this reason, and I will not be deemed worthy to be blessed with the sign of the cross. And we hear my mother calling him from inside. Let him come in because he will be the last person I will cross. He went inside. She blessed him and told him, you are fortunate because you happen to be the last person I will cross. And so it happened. The next day, on the seventh day of August, she slept in the Lord, one day after the feast day, and on the eighth day, her funeral service was being carried out. A funeral like my mother's was unprecedented here in our area. Bishops, dozens of priests, and thousands of people came to pay their last respects. Many eulogies, many talks, and much honor and appreciation was shown toward the deceased. In short, this was the life story the action, and the Christian service of my blessed mother, Hadzina, and Yarondesa Philothe, who is now resting at the right hand of the Lord. My father slept in the Lord in 1946. My mother was tonsured a nun at the Holy Land in 1953, where she had visited about ten times. On one of these trips, she brought back a large cross given to her by the patriarch, bearing his signature and a special dedication. This cross was placed in the altar of the third church she built, named in honor of the precious cross. The other two churches were built in the honor of the transfiguration of the Savior and of Saint Spiridon. The purpose of her wishing me to become a priest was so I could bless the people with the Holy Cross without having to face the obstacles she encountered being a woman. She divided her estate with a will to all my brothers and sisters, and she left the cross as part of my inheritance. The monastery she left in our name to be kept as is, we cannot sell it, 
but we are to provide it for free to any monks or nuns who wish to exercise their life of monasticism in it. And as you can see, it is fully equipped. So far, in all the aforesaid, you saw very many miracles carried out by the grace of God through the precious cross, and all these are enough to convince even the most unbelieving human being. However, let's mention another two, three, which happened during my tenure of the precious cross, extraordinary and quite shocking to say the least. The first one involved a doctor from Hanya named Konstantin Bozakakis. He was a colonel in the army, a military doctor, and he also operated a clinic in the city of Hanya. As far as I'm concerned, this was the greatest of miracles because this doctor was a godless unbeliever. He suffered from cancer and he had undergone nine operations, four in Athens and five abroad. After every operation, the doctors were assuring him that this would be the last one and he would become well. They simply removed the malignant growth, and after a few months, it would emerge again and again, finding himself in and out of the operating room nine times. From the upper part of his sternum all the way to his stomach, there were nine different slanted incisions. He had become a walking skeleton of a man, and he could not eat, drink, or sleep. After the ninth operation, he resigned from the army. He closed down his medical clinic, and he awaited death. His brother-in-law, the brother of his wife, and I went to high school together, and he happened to know about my mother and about the grace and the power of the precious cross. So after his return from the ninth operation, his brother-in-law told him, Constantine, look, I happen to know of a doctor who can make you well. If you promise me that you will not laugh and you will not mock, I will tell you all about this doctor, and you can become well. He said this because he was an unbeliever. He was preparing him. Very well, tell me, and I promise you not to laugh. The brother-in-law at this point did not even know my mother's whereabouts or even if she was alive. So he said, I will ask and find out where is this cross that I told you about, and then we will make arrangements to go. Would you go? He said, yes, of course we can go, he answered. He asked around different people, and finally he got in touch with me on the telephone. He introduced himself, reminding me that we were classmates, and he asked, by the way, where's your mother? I said, my mother is in heaven. Well, where's the precious cross? I said, the cross is with me. And he went on to explain about the condition of his colonel brother-in-law, and he gave me all the details, and he asked if they would come to have him blessed with a cross. I said, of course you may come, I said, and... We set an appointment for a Sunday, Sunday after church, about 12 to 1 o'clock. When they arrived, we visited for a little while, and we started off with the usual typical conversation, the things we talk about when we first meet someone. And at some point, the doctor began with his declaration, Papa, I want you to know that I don't believe in God. I'm an unbeliever. I believe nothing, nothing about God nothing about the Panagia, nor the saints, nor the cross, let alone the priests. I don't believe any of it. I consider all these things ridiculous, and I don't believe any of it, and furthermore, I don't have the best relations with priests in general. I happen to believe in a higher power, and nothing more. Now, what you call this higher power is up to you. Of course, I'm aware of different things and metaphysical events that cannot be explained. I know this. So, I know that something higher does exist. I spent about two and a half hours trying to convince him that his belief system is contrary to reality and even harmful, but to no avail. He fought me every step of the way, and we both felt exhausted after all this endless and fruitless conversation. So at the end, I felt compelled to end this conversation with this statement. My doctor, from what I gather, You're under the impression that I am some kind of a magician, some wizard who reads a few spells and works out some healings. You are dead wrong. I'm an Orthodox priest, and I act according to the statutes of my church. I do what my faith and what my religion teaches. Now, if you accept the things that our Orthodox church teaches, then we can proceed. If not, 
and you and I are wasting our time. So I have two prescriptions to give you, and if we can agree to combine these two medicines together, and you take them with faith and free will, rest assured that you will become well. Otherwise, let's, let's leave well enough alone, and each one of us can go having his own opinion and his way of believing. I have nothing else to tell you. He tells me, go ahead and tell me about these two drugs. But be careful, I said, because these drugs are not like those of your medical profession. They are not made of various poisons and chemicals. The first drug is your own faith. You must believe that it is possible for the grace of the precious cross to make you well. The other drug is my own prayer. I will pray according to how my church teaches me. I will do the readings prescribed by my church, and I will pray a supplication service to the Holy Cross. I will ask for God's grace to work through his precious cross to give you your help. Now, if we can somehow combine these two drugs, then we will succeed. God will listen to us. If you don't want to follow these guidelines, then let's not waste our time. After this approach, he seemed to be somewhat relaxed, calm, and deeply moved. He stood up and he told me, Father, I do believe, and do whatever it takes. I asked him to come towards the icon stand, where he made his cross for the first time in God knows how many years, and he venerated all the icons. I asked him, where do you feel pain at this point? He lifted up his shirt, and I stared in shock. I saw nine knife wounds on his chest, half on the one side, the rest on the other side. So I touched the precious cross on his chest cavity, and it stuck to it like a suction cup. Now, he seemed to be perplexed. Even though he previously said that he believed, he could not come to grip with this attachment of the cross. He was thinking, well, I go along with everything else, but what is this adhesion? Whoever heard of silver sticking to bare skin like a suction cup? He was suspecting some kind of a magnetic energy, so he expressed his suspicion. Father, do I have your permission to take the cross in my hands? I said, of course, I said, and I walked away. While the cross remained suspended on him along with the chain, and a number of other jewelry that people offered as vows of their faith and gratefulness, when he saw that the cross, with all this weight, was hanging on him, he was flabbergasted. No, 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 Father, I'm not going to touch it. I don't want to touch it. You do whatever you need to do. So I blessed him, making the sign of the cross on him, and he said, when do you want us to come back again? I said, any time and any day you wish. So we made an appointment for Wednesday afternoon, and they left. The very next day, he phoned me, and he said, Father, last night I was able to eat and drink normally. I slept well, and I feel fine. I said, very well, it looks like our medicine is working. The combination of our drugs is successful. He said, Father, I don't want to wait till Wednesday. Can I please come and see you in about an hour? He came with his entire family, his wife, his mother, his children. They all came to thank me. When he entered the door of the church, he made his cross deep, deeply touched and showing signs of repentance. He proceeded to hug me and kiss my hand and so on. So he repeated the crossings and they left. And here we must mention that two great miracles took place. His physical healing on one hand and his spiritual healing. On the other hand, he believed and repented for his unbelief, and not to mention that the spiritual healing is a greater miracle than the physical. And that's why I proceeded to tell you that I personally believe that this is one of the greatest miracles that I ever witnessed because this man was an unbeliever. When he came for the third crossing, it was the day before his name day, the feast day of St. Constantine and Helen. The next day was his name day, and he would be going to his home village to celebrate. This would be his first visit after being away many, many years due to his long-term illness and due to his demanding occupation. 
So he decided to spend his name day at the village of his birth. So he went to the village and he was received with great joy and much fanfare from everyone, not only because they hadn't seen him for many, many years, but mostly because they had written him off as a dead man. They showered him with great hospitality and much honor, being his feast day. He ate everything offered to him, grilled meats, baked, barbecued with hot sauces, and he drank plenty of wine, something that the doctors frowned upon. They told him not to even think about, not to even smell it. After he ate and drank exceedingly until 10.30 at night, he was still not content, even though he ate everything in sight, foods prohibited by his medical profession. And unfortunately, he was doing this out of doubt. He was somehow trying to test himself to see if he was truly healed. Unfortunately, even though he saw the miraculous energy of the cross, he saw immediate results, the virus of doubt was still working inside of him. The devil took advantage of this evil seed of doubt and pushed him to an action of medical insanity. What did he do? In order to be totally sure that he was absolutely healed by the miraculous cross, at 10.30 at night he left from a table and he went to one of his relatives who owned honeycombs, beehives, and he asked him at 10.30 at night to go and bring him a portion of a honeycomb so he could eat it. His relative tells him, My dear Costa, I will give you as much as you want, but I don't think you should have it. After all you ate and drunk, this honey is in its pure form. It will be devastating to your health. And we all know that this honey is not to be eaten after a full meal, especially in the honeycomb state. It is very heavy. He insisted like a little child, so his relative gave in. And he ate much honey along with beeswax. And he left and he went home feeling fine. He went to sleep with no problem. In the morning hours, he was awakened by an unbearable sharp pain an excruciating pain making him twist and turn in agony. His wife called me first thing in the morning, please save us, Father, the doctor is dying. I said, what happened? He was doing so well. I went to Hanya to see him right away, and I asked, Dr. Costa, what's happening to you? Tell me. Papa, this is all because of my sins. This is the result of my sinfulness. What sins? Doctor, you've repented. You changed your life. How can you possibly sin again like before? I did something very evil, a great evil, and the grace of the precious cross is now punishing me. What did you do? What did I do? Yesterday, while celebrating my name day, a seed of doubt sprouted inside of me about my healing, and I wanted to test myself to see if I was totally healed, to be totally assured that the miracle was for real, and not simply the result of positive thinking, something empowered by my own will. Doctor, how could you do this after all the facts and after this incredible miracle, you still have doubts? My father, you're right. Tell me what you will, but this is what I did. So I crossed him again, and he regained his health. From 1980, the year of his miraculous cure, until 1983, he was in perfect health. He gained 12 pounds, and he lived a normal life. He came repeatedly to confession, and he received Holy Communion. He became a very good Christian, and he became an active member of at least half a dozen of Christ Christian brotherhoods of Hanya. I asked him, why are you working so hard? These societies can be a lot of hard work. Father, I must do this to make up for lost time. I missed out all those years of my ignorance, and I failed to help the needy, so now I feel compelled to give it all at once. Up to 1983, he was in perfect health. Shortly after 1983, however, he began to silence the miracle, to hide it, and even deny it. He was saying it seemed that way, it was probably a self-delusion and mind over matter, or the result of positive thinking. My metabolism simply fought the disease and I became well. This, as you can understand, was a great betrayal, and not simply a denial, and something that did not escape God's detection or punishment. Two years ago, he suffered severe swelling in his throat area. His throat closed altogether. They flew him immediately abroad to the doctors who cut him up all those times, and they diagnosed cancer of the throat. He specifically asked the doctors, is this cancer of the throat related, and has it spread from my previous cancer of the chest area? The answer was, not so. 
your chest and the rest of your body is totally healed from your previous cancer. There are no signs of any ailment. It is like it never happened. This cancer of your throat is totally different, and it is limited to your throat only. It has no relation to your previous disease whatsoever. After this medical confirmation, he understood that his new ailment was the rightful punishment of God for his unfaithfulness and betrayal. He came to his senses, he repented, and he made his wife call me on the phone. He was deeply ashamed for his actions. He didn't want to speak to me, and he asked his wife to give me a call and give me all this information about him. This was all news to me because I lost contact with him for a while. I had no idea that he was ill and out of the country. Now he was coming back to Greece, and my house would be his first stop. This awesome and extraordinary factual account is of great importance and significance because on the one hand, we see the grace and love and benevolence of God ready to help and benefit the physical and spiritual ailments of the fallen men, but on the other hand, to punish, but punish with much love, the backsliding and sinful man in order to wake him up and bring him back to the fold. This is one of the greatest miracles aimed for the salvation, not only of his body, but his soul, and it's certainly not a small matter for a godless colonel, an accomplished doctor, to believe and to start being a preacher. Glory be to God. As we said, this miracle took place in Hanya, and now we will talk about another great miracle that took place here in Rathibano. There's a man around here by the name of Mikhail Galanis, an owner of a jewelry store, a good fellow, and a good family man. His wife gave birth to a boy in Athens, but the baby was born with a serious health problem. The liver did not have adequate pores for the blood to pass through, and the fecal matter was rather white, colorless. The medical professor and leading authority of the hospital baptized the child instantly because death was imminent. They attempted a surgery only to confirm what they had already diagnosed, that the liver was dysfunctional. They told him they could take the child and go home since there is nothing that could be done to save his life. Instead, he takes the child and flies to France. He was very well to do financially. So after the necessary examinations, the French doctors reassured him that the Athenian doctors were correct. The child did not have any chances of survival. He flew back from France convinced that this was his lot and he was coming to Crete to have his child die. He came to visit me one evening about 8 or 9 o'clock, and he said, Papa Stavro, I came to ask you for a burial lot, and at the time I was in charge of the church cemetery. I said, what's the matter, Michael? Papa, my newly born, has no life, according to the doctors, so I want to choose a burial spot for his tomb. He could not hold back his tears while telling me all this, and I was feeling very sorry for him. Now keep in mind that in all the years of keeping the cross, and this was also the case with my mother, I never told anyone to bring a sick person to be crossed because I think that the ill person must ask for the grace of God themselves. And I didn't feel that it was proper for me to be given it without being asked. But in this particular case, while listening to this dramatic ordeal, I felt a certain illumination. And... This became obvious from the course of the events. So I told him, listen, Michali, I don't have a spot for your child in this cemetery, but tomorrow is Sunday. I will be celebrating the liturgy at St. Nicholas. Please tell your wife to bring the child to the church. I will have the precious cross, and I will cross the child with it, and I believe that your son will become well. He looked at me with a painful smile, and he told me, Papa, Are you joking? Look, my child died. I came here to ask you for a place to bury it, and you want to cross it in a church? Didn't you tell me that the child is still alive? Yes, but his soul is leaving any moment now. Michali, do what I tell you. Papa Stavro, don't play with my mind. I have enough pain. Look, when I return home, the child will be gone. His godmother bought his burial clothes, and I have them here in this box. Mihaly, what do you have to lose? Go home and bring the child to the church. I told you, I don't have a tomb for your child. 
For anyone else in your family, I have plenty of tombs, but I don't have one for your child. He tells me, Papa, come to your senses. I took the child all over the world, and I spent all kinds of money, and now I want to spend the last of it to prepare his grave. Mikhadi, I told you, and I'm telling you again, there is no grave for your child. For anyone else, yes, but not for your child. Now he was beginning to lose his temper. Papa, I respect you, and I like you, and I don't want us to have an argument. Whether we argue or not, I'm telling you, there is no grave for your child. Now he was getting hot. Now listen, Papa Stavro, if you force me to buy a grave somewhere else outside of this village, I will do all kinds of things that you're not going to be happy with. I don't want to go that far. Do whatever you want, but I don't have a grave for your child. We fought like this for about an hour and a half, and finally I told him, look, go, and if your child dies until tomorrow, I will give you a place for it. Go now. What else do you want me to do? While leaving and going down the steps, he turns again and says, Papa, I don't want to lose the respect I have for your person. Michali, go, and God be with you. I go inside, and now the presbytera starts. Papa, have you lost your marbles? What are you doing? Do you know who you're dealing with? He will ridicule you all over this island. I said, Papa, yeah, please go to your kitchen and do your work. My goodness, Papa, what's come over you tonight? I don't know what's come over me, but I will not give him a grave for his child. I carried on like this without really knowing why and without my own will. My behavior was strange and hard to understand. Sunday morning in church, during the liturgy, I saw a woman holding a blanket. I didn't recognize her, but uh, when she went and stood next to the icon of the Panagia, I got the feeling that she was Mihaly's wife. I felt at ease because I was a bit nervous all this time, and I was fervently praying to St. Nicholas to bring her to the church. After the liturgy, I asked her, are you Mihaly's wife? And she said, yes. So I took the prayer book, and I read the two prayers for all maladies, and I crossed the child. I saw that the child was almost lifeless, and I thought, if the child lived through the day, I was going to bless it again. So I went and did a second crossing, and uh, I also went Monday and did a third crossing. The child was constantly shrinking, and he was like a vegetable, almost dead, but still alive. Wednesday night, we had a parish council meeting, and during this meeting, Michali walks in tears and announces, And now, Papa, what are you going to do? Are you not going to give me a grave? I said, Did the boy die? He's breathing his last. I'm not a prophet or some kind of a seer, but God gave me the strength and the illumination, and I repeat it. Michali, I told you, and I'm telling you over again, I will not give you a grave for your child. If you want to, if you want to reserve one for your parents or for any other relative, let's go now, and you can choose anyone you want. But there is no grave for this child. This reaction of mine towards this simple request was so automatic and so bizarre that I myself could not figure it out why I was responding like this. This was almost like temporary insanity. The members of the parish council heard this dialogue. They heard Mihaly's threats, and they asked to see what was the difficulty. Mihaly was quick to explain, look, my sick child is dying, and I asked Papa Stavro for a grave, and he's refusing me. The council members knew that we had plenty of spaces. They asked me, Papa, why aren't you giving the man a grave for his child? Michali explained to them why I don't give you a grave. I don't have one for your child, but I told you, you can choose one for anybody else. One of the council members says, Papa, what are you saying? What do you care whom he puts inside this grave? Don't you guys get it all this time? I believe that his child will not die, and for this reason, I don't want to be making up papers for nothing, to name a tomb after his child. But he's telling you that the child died, and they put him in the box. I said the child did not die yet, and I promise you that if he dies, and they cross his hands, then you can come, and I will give you a brand new grave. But I'm telling you that the child did not die. Mikhail responds, Papa, if what you're telling me proves to be true, I'm making a vow right now to come all the way to your house on my knees. I said, Mikhail, do not repeat this vow. Retract it. 
because this distance is about two miles, it is a highway, and you will not be allowed to travel more than a foot. And furthermore, God does not want such a humiliation of any person. God wants your heart to give him your heart, your faith, your soul, your love, and he will give you his love. And if you want to make this distance on your knees, I will not allow you. Finally, he says, let my child live, and we will discuss this matter over again. I will have no problem, and I will not be ashamed to pass through the middle of the city on my knees if my child becomes well. After this, he left. The parish council members sounded just like my presbyter. Papa, do you know who you're dealing with? He will have no trouble humiliating you all over this island. I said, it doesn't bother me. He got home, and he saw that the women were frantic. What's going on, he asked. The child passed his feces normally. I forgot to mention that up to this point, the doctors had made an artificial opening uh, for the feces to be expelled from the side. So Mihaly calls Athens immediately, and he tells the godmother, the leading doctor and professor of the hospital, about this news. She suggested, don't feed the child anything Put the child in an airplane and bring the child immediately here in Athens. He was illumined by God at that moment. He also called the doctors of France, and their response was the same. Do not do anything else to the child, but fly the child here immediately in France. He passes from Athens and informs the godmother at the hospital that he prefers to head to France at the request of the French doctors. The godmother said, very well, I'm coming along with you. They got to France, the doctors opened the child up, and they see the liver in perfect condition, functioning normally and perfectly, and they were amazed. They were speechless, not knowing the cause of the healing. They closed the child up in disbelief, and the child was flown back to Crete. In the meantime, I lost Mihaly's tracks. I knew nothing about all this. A few days later, he showed up and says, Papa, I came to apologize, and he explained the unfolding recent dramatic events. Mihaly, you know how I'm going to accept your apology? Under this condition. When the boy becomes 12 years old, I will take him to the cemetery and I will take his picture next to the tomb you were fighting to put him in. I will tell him that your father was fighting me to put you in here, but the grace of God saved you from certain death. Mihaly was laughing. He advertised this miracle in the newspapers, all over the place, something that I did not wish for. And he also confessed this miracle to the doctors of France, and one of them asked to come to Crete and to see this priest with the precious cross. He was a Roman Catholic man, and he came to Crete, and he visited me, and he confessed, when the grace of God works this way, how can we, the doctors, deny it? So this is the second and somewhat bizarre, but also very powerful miracle. This fight that I put up was totally uncharacteristic, and I don't remember anything like this for myself or for my mother. I can't say that this fight was dependent on me alone. Uh, all I can say is that I fought with myself, with Michalis, with the parish council members, and much more with my presbytera, my wife. All is well, that ends well. And now the child is about eight years old, and he's doing very well. And now we will mention one more miracle that took place in Iraklio, and so we can cover every major city in this area. We cover one in Kanya, one in Arethimino, and now one in Iraklio. This had to do with an associate professor of urology named Christos Dimitropoulos. He had two girls. The older girl had dysfunctional kidneys, and due to a congenital condition, they failed to grow along with the rest of the body was convinced from a scientific point of view that cure and salvation of the child was impossible. As very caring parents, they tried to keep the child alive with special foods and drugs, and the girl was reduced to a skeleton. He knew nothing. He was totally uninformed about the grace of the precious cross. He had a sister in the U.S., and as a last resort, they admitted the girl in a very large and famous hospital in the United States to see if something could be done. A transplant was not possible because the child was only two years old. They kept the child there for about three months, but to no avail, there was no change whatsoever. Within these three months, the doctor was informed about the grace of the precious cross. And one day he showed up at my doorsteps, and I did not know him. I 
knew he was some kind of a doctor from the insignia on the car, but it is not my style to ask who are you and what do you do for a living. I like to treat everybody the same. He came inside and he introduced himself. He was extremely polite. He sat and he was holding a package in his hand. He told me, my father, I came because I have a sick child and he did not specify about the illness. My child is now in America and I cannot bring her here due to her illness. So I came to ask you to please cross her clothing. Bless these clothes so I can send them to her. And if you have some other holy object, you can give me so I can send it along. I crossed the clothing and I did the reading of prayers over it and I gave him some cotton with oil from the Holy Cross. He took them with much faith and excitement and he left with a very grateful heart. He sends the clothes to the U.S. and he calls his wife and instructs her, I'm sending you a pack of new clothes for the child. Now when you receive them, you must put them on the child immediately. His wife did not ask why and he did not mention anything either. She knew that he was extremely attached to the child and he was expressing his emotions this way by buying her new clothes. This hospital was examining the child on a daily basis, and the conclusion, the conclusion up to this point was that this condition was hopeless. Nevertheless, the mother, at the request of her husband, dressed the child in the new clothing sent by mail. The following day, the child was re-examined, and the doctors, to their great amazement and disbelief, discovered a great turnaround and a significant improvement. The doctors involved called a special meeting, not knowing how to explain this. And they were asking the mother, what's going on? What did you do? She was clueless. She said, I didn't do a thing. And truly, she knew nothing about her husband's uh, doing and the blessing of the clothing. So at noon, her husband called her on the phone and asked about the condition of the child. She said, the circulation to the kidneys has greatly improved. When he heard this, he told her, take the child and fly back here immediately. My dear doctor, what's, going, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? How can I do this, especially now that the child is getting better? You heard me. Take the child and return back to Crete. The blessed man did not give to her any explanation about the crossing and the cross, but he simply ordered her to come back immediately. She proceeded to tell the doctors about her husband's request, and the doctor said, no, this is not simple. We cannot do this. They said this would only be possible if her husband would make a request by a telegram certified by the local police, clearing them of all responsibilities in the event that something would happen to the child. He did this immediately. So his wife and his sister took the child and they left and he had made all the necessary flight arrangements from here. No one knew why the doctor was acting like this. They assumed that the pain for the child had pushed the doctor towards temporary insanity because he was truly attached, very, very crazy about this child in a good sense. He missed the child so much that he needed to see it, they thought. In the meantime, he traded his car in for a brand new one because he wanted his darling daughter to ride in a brand new car. After all these preparations, he called me on the phone and he says, My papa, my child is coming from the U.S. and I want her to enter the house along with a precious cross. So please do me the favor and come. I asked, when are you expecting them? At 10 o'clock. I said, I will be at the airport of Heraclio at 9.30. So in a few minutes, the doctor was receiving his wife and his sister who were weeping because they thought that this unexplained insanity of the doctor would be destructive to any chances of the child becoming well, especially since they noticed significant improvement in that American hospital. He ran and grabbed his child out of his wife's arms. He was kissing it uncontrollably. And at some point he says, let's go. He was beside himself, so he forgot to introduce me. So his family members saw a priest following along, but they were more perplexed, especially since they knew that the doctor did not have any special relations with the church and her priests. So we enter our cars, they drove in front, and we followed behind this brand new car. His wife, his sister, and one of his close friends, they all got in a car, and we were headed towards the exit of the airport. We, we exited the airport, and when we entered the main road, his car stalled. Banayim, now what? He said. This is a brand new car, three, four days old. He checked the gas, the belts, quickly inspected the engine, but he could not find anything wrong. 
I got out of my car and asked him, what's wrong? He said, I don't know. The car stalled and it will not start up. Coincidentally, a mechanic was passing by who was acquainted with a doctor. He pulled over and he came to our aid and one of his sisters had been cured at the doctor's clinic. So he stopped and asked, doctor, what's the matter? I don't know. This is a brand new car, but it stopped and it does not start up again. The mechanic looks around, he tries a number of things, but there is no change. Maybe you have a dead battery. So he took out his jumper cables to see if this could be the problem, but nothing again. My presbytera tells me, Papa, why don't you drive in the front? Maybe the grace of the cross wants to be leading the way. I was delighted by the illumination of my presbytera, so I started up my car and I said, get in your car, let's go. Close the doors and the car will start up, you will see. I drove in front of them, and lo and behold, their car started immediately. We arrived at their home, and the doctor asked me, Father, what happened? What was the deal with my car? I will tell you. You called me and invited the grace of the precious cross to enter first in your house, and you started driving up front, and you left the precious cross in your back behind you. Oh, my goodness, how did I do this? Oh, Father, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. What a blunder. He embraced the cross. He kissed it. And while apologizing repeatedly, his family members were watching all this, not knowing what to do. They were crossing themselves. The wind was blowing, and his wife, who had the child wrapped in a blanket to protect it from the wind, took a few steps towards the door. The doctor ran after her, grabbed her by the collar of her coat, and pulled her back. He almost knocked her down. Don't go into the house. Papa Stavra must enter the house first. She began to cross herself, thinking this man really lost his marbles. She was looking at me and all the others, thinking, what am, am I going to do with this guy? Trying to make sense of all this. My dear husband, what is this craziness of yours? Finally, I went into the house first, and the rest followed the undressed child, and I crossed it, and we all sat down. Then the doctor explained to them everything that was going on. For goodness sakes, my dear husband, you uprooted us from the hospital on the opposite side of the world. You kept us in so much agony. Couldn't you just give us some details, some hint of what was going on? On top of everything else, we thought you were insane. He says, that's okay. I plead insanity. Let my child be saved and let me be insane. Why couldn't you let us know what was happening? But you put us through this misery. What did we owe you for you to treat us like this? No, you did not need to know because you would mess up my plans. You would have not have come because you would not have believed in the miracle. From that day on, we started weekly crossings for the child. He was coming to Rathimno every Sunday morning about 70, 80 kilometers distance one way. He attended the liturgy, and after the end of the liturgy, he would drive me back to Heraklio. We would cross the child, and then he would bring me back home. And this went on for about three years continually. The child was growing up very normally, and everyone was astounded by her intelligence. She was now in kindergarten, and she was the talk of the town. The father was telling me, Papa Stavra, I pray that the grace of God keeps my child until she becomes seven years old, so we can then go and do a kidney transplant. He did a vow not to eat oil on Wednesday and Friday as many years as he lived. At some point, he was at a medical conference at a big banquet in a grand hotel, and he was the guest of honor by his fellow doctors. He attended, of course, but because it was Wednesday, he requested the waitress to bring him plain tomatoes and olives as his sole meal, something that did not escape the irony and cynicism of his colleagues. He stood his ground, and he confessed, I don't care what you think and what you believe. All I know is that my child is alive from the grace of God, and I really don't care about being mocked and ridiculed. I made a vow, and I will keep it. I did not offend you by refusing to come. I came, but I will eat what I feel will be of benefit to me and not all these different meats. So when a child became seven years old, they took her back to the same American hospital they took it out of five years prior to the doctors who discounted any chance of salvation. So it happened that in those days, a child about seven, eight years old was struck by a car and died. They took one of the kidneys of the struck child and they transplanted it 
to the doctor's child. The transplant was successful, and now the other kidney is functioning quite normally, and the child is enjoying great health. From that time on, the doctor is always here on the feast day of our church, and he comes early and waits outside, and he serves in many of the needs of the church at every different capacity. He helps whenever he's, he's needed, and he tells me, I will do anything for Papa Stavro, and I always correct him, Doc, you will not do anything for Papa Stavro. You are doing everything for Christ and his precious cross. Papa Stavros is nothing. The power of the cross is everything. All these miracles we mentioned should be enough for us to understand the love, the mercy, and the compassion of God for the sinful and often ungrateful men. These miracles are also instrumental in helping us to develop an unshakable faith in his power and grace and to develop fruits and works of repentance and from these loving energies of God to be convinced that God's presence and power is available to us always, at all times, at all centuries, because many times we tend to think that miracles only happen years and centuries ago, some time back when. No, we have enough proof to believe that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and to the ages of ages. I pray but the grace of God and the precious cross to be always with you. The translators of St. Nicodemus would like to thank Father Stavros, and we pray that God grants him many, many years, especially since today I am finishing these last words of this translation on his name day, today, Sunday, the 14th of September, 2003, the great feast of the universal exaltation of the precious and life-giving cross. Father Stavros gave us a blessing back in April of this year to make this faith-strengthening information available to the English-speaking world for the glory of God. We also pray for the rest of the soul of Thomas Tsonakos, who did the initial work in the Greek language, as we mentioned earlier. Oh.